What I'm doing tonight is actually expounding on what Phil just introduced to you. I want to, I want to go in a little bit more depth uh, with, with that ask, admire, admit that he just talked about in, in the, the gospel, the, the, as it, we learned it while we were uh, in Chicago, at least the way to present it as we learned it while we were in Chicago. Um, I read a quote from a pastor by the name of Tim Keller. He said this, he said, Teenagers have more information about God than they have experiences of Him. Get them in places where they have to rely on God. And I believe that to be true, and that, uh, that is one of the many reasons I've enjoyed taking students to Chicago for the last several years. Uh, this trip is unlike any other trip I have taken students on because this trip forces our students to rely on God. They can't do it on their own strength, and they realize that quickly. But please don't misunderstand me. This, this trip is not just about a week-long experience. Uh, they, they shared about their days there. That was the, you know, the importance of the, or the, the purpose of a debrief. They shared about what happened on that week, but it's designed to equip them to share the gospel at home. It's designed to equip them to share the gospel with friends and family. And, and that is what I want to I do tonight. I want to share with you some of the training they received uh, in a little greater depth and uh, and hopefully, um, you'll have the condensed version, obviously, because they were there for a week, and I'm, I'm not giving you a week's worth, don't worry, um, all in, in one evening. But I want to give you an idea of what they learned so that you, too, uh, have a, a few more tools uh, in your, your tool belt, uh, maybe uh, some additional uh, strategies or ways to communicate the gospel message. But before I dive in, I want to present two scenarios to you. I want, I want you to imagine, and this might not be hard, this might have been what you did this afternoon. Uh, I want you to imagine sitting on your couch, maybe sitting on a recliner, and you have your TV on, and you start flipping through the channels, and as you're flipping through the channels, you realize there's nothing on, but you flip anyway. You've gone through several times now, the whole, every channel, whether that's four or, you know, 400. You've, you've gone through them all, there's nothing on, and you're flipping, you're flipping, and finally you find a, a documentary, informational type uh, show, and it's about, it's, it basically, it's a how-to of how to defuse a bomb. And so you're, you're curious, there's nothing else on, and you've never had to defuse a bomb before, and you have really no intentions of ever putting yourself in a situation in the future where you'll need to defuse a bomb, but there's nothing on TV, and so you start watching out of curiosity. And so you start watching this, and then, you know, after a little while, you, it's a documentary, so you, you know, you lose a little bit of interest, and you pull out your phone. Maybe you're checking email or Facebooking. Maybe you need to use uh, the restroom, but you don't bother waiting for a commercial because it's not like you're going to actually defuse a bomb anytime soon. So if you miss a few steps, it's going to be okay. Uh, and so you watch the whole thing, kind of. You were a little bit distracted, but in the end, you kind of have the right idea. You have the general approach. You're not sure if it's the red wire or the blue wire, but you, you, know, you get the idea. You know how to defuse a bomb, and you might even you know, give somebody some coaching tips if they ask. Uh, now imagine a different scenario. Imagine you're in the military, and you drew the, the short straw. You've been chosen to become the bomb expert of your group. You're, you're somewhere where there's roadside bombs, or there's different explosives of, explosives of different types, and, and it's your job to defuse those bombs when you come across them as a group. And so you're sitting in a classroom somewhere, and your military instructor is walking you through how to defuse a bomb. I imagine in that situation, you would pay attention. I think Facebook could wait. Email could wait. I, I think you might even take notes. Uh, you might even record it if possible, because you don't want to forget that information. That information is important, and you're actually going to put it into practice in the near future, and lives are on the line. I share that with you because I believe uh, in a situation like that, you pay attention differently. And as I share with you a little bit in, in these uh, next, uh, you know, the, the remaining minutes of tonight, I want to encourage you to think about how these students listened when they were in Chicago. As they sat in class, they were getting ready to go out and share the gospel just hours later. And that changes the way you listen. Uh, the content can be absolutely the same. Maybe you go through, and oh, that doesn't sound all that groundbreaking. I can't believe you took them all the way to Chicago to learn that. Uh, you know, and that might be the, you know, a reaction. That might be a possibility or something that's going through your head. I don't know, but, but what's important is the context. You listen differently when you know you're going to have to use what you're listening to. You listen differently when you start realizing that souls are hanging in the balance, that it is, uh, you're about to engage in intense spiritual warfare. You listen differently. And so I want to I I encourage you to imagine 
Imagine that you are going to share the gospel in the next 24 hours. Imagine that as you go to work tomorrow or in your community or wherever the Lord takes you in the next 24 hours, that you're going to share the gospel with somebody. Imagine that. Imagine that, you, that you're going to do that. I think maybe you will listen this evening maybe a little bit like how they listened in Chicago. If you made that commitment, in fact, maybe don't even imagine, maybe plan to do that and then see how you listen. Uh, not that because my words are all that great. I'm just repeating what they were already taught by somebody else other than me. This isn't uh, my words. It's ultimately, it's the, God's word uh, that we're looking at. We're just looking at one way to, to package it, one way to present it. But I think uh, you would listen differently. You could put yourself in the position, in the shoes of our students. And I think you would listen differently, but I also think you'll pray differently. If you made that commitment, I think uh, as you put your head on your pillow tonight, you would pray like we talked about last week, if you were here last Sunday night. Lord, open to me a door to declare the mystery of Christ. Like Paul prayed in Colossians 4, that, or he, like, as he asked for prayer, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. I think we would listen differently. I think we'd all pray differently if, if we planned to put uh, this into practice. Well, let me, as we talk about prayer, let me, let me pray. Uh, and uh, I know we're well into the service, but let me pray for our time uh, this evening. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the opportunity to worship you as a body of believers. I thank you for these students uh, who chose uh, or uh, had their parents strongly encourage them to come to Chicago. Uh, I thank you that they were able to come. I thank you that they saw you at work. I think that they got a picture and I, at least a glimpse of what you're capable of doing. I, I thank you that they got to experience the joy of serving you. God, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for Carson and Erica leading worship this evening. God, I thank you for them as interns at Calvary Bible Church that as young adults... Um, that they're using their gifts to serve you. For, for Dan in the sound booth, again, just uh, choosing to, to serve you this summer. God, it's a joy to, to see these young people, whether it's in Chicago or here at Calvary, serving you. God, I thank you for that. And Lord, I do ask that you would open for each of us a door to declare the mystery of Christ, if, if possible, in the next day, that we would be able to talk to somebody who doesn't know you about you, about your son, Jesus Christ, God. I pray that you'd give us the opportunity to do that, and when that time comes, you'd give us clarity and boldness to share the gospel with them, God. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to um, quickly give you an overview of, of what Phil introduced to you, and I actually, he called me earlier this week, and I said, well, it sounds like you just need to do the whole sermon. I'm just going to let you go with it, um, and, uh, and so I jokingly this earlier said, you know, you're, you're part A, and I'll be part B, and uh, you introduce it, and then I'll come through it and, and follow it up. And so he, he talked to you about ask, admire, admit as a, as a way we, we, they, they taught the students uh, to start a gospel conversation. The way to, because that's usually one of the hardest parts of, uh, of evangelism is, is taking off, is, is, is just getting going. And so we wanted to help them with that. And so the first step is ask, ask engaging questions. We want students asking uh, questions, and asking questions does at least three powerful things. I'm sure it does more things than that, but first it breaks down barriers and opens hearts. Asking questions and listening is a powerful way to show the love of God. In a busy world, when you slow down to ask and really listen to somebody, it stands out. It, they remember what uh, those moments. Very few people listen anymore, and so when we ask questions and actually listen, it, people notice. People are curious what it is we're doing, that we're listening. Uh, we see Jesus ask questions all throughout the Gospels, and, and he does it often. It breaks barriers. We think of uh, in John chapter 4 and verse 7, he asks a question to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And he says, will you give me a drink? And you might think, well, that's just a question. What's the big deal? Well, there were barriers being broken, uh, being just completely demolished at that moment when Jesus asked a Samaritan woman a question. One, he's a man talking to a woman. He's talking to, as a Jewish man, talking to a Samaritan woman. It was, I'm sure, a memorable moment uh, for that, that woman. Secondly, if, uh, when we ask questions, it helps uh, us understand and empathize with others. We can get to know them. We get to hear where they're at. It, it gives us uh, time also to pray and ask God for help. When we ask questions, uh, when we're sharing the gospel, that gives us some time to to take a break, uh, in a sense, to, to listen, but also pray as we're listening and ask God to give us the words to say, to how to respond, how to turn the conversation uh, to Christ. 
Asking questions buys us time to really lean into the Holy Spirit and, and ask for wisdom on how to proceed with the conversation. And perhaps the most uh, significant reason, or the best reason to ask questions is that Jesus asked engaging questions. In the Gospels, um, there's uh, about 300 questions recorded that Jesus asked, and that's just a snapshot of his of ministry. We know Jesus did more than what's recorded, and yet we have 300 questions. Mark 8 alone, Jesus asked 16 questions. And you probably recognize some of them. Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? Who do people say that I am? What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Good questions can activate the mind. They, they, stir, they stir the soul. To get people thinking more than maybe a presentation, uh, a simple dialogue does. And during our time in Chicago, our students were encouraged to ask engaging questions, but not just random questions, not just uh, uh, pointless questions, and, uh, questions regarding what people believe. We wanted to start out and break stereotypes and ask individuals, what, what do you believe? Before we ever got into what we believe, we wanted to ask people, what, what do you believe? Do you have any spiritual beliefs? People love to talk about themselves, talk about what they believe. They might not love listening to us, but you give them an opportunity to talk about what they believe, most people take it. People who would normally say, I don't want to talk about religion, will talk about what they believe, and what happens usually is that after you've given them the chance to talk and you've listened deeply to them, well, they're inclined to let you share what you believe. And so we saw that time and time again. People would share what they believe, and often it actually helped us focus on certain things. When someone shares that they're a Muslim or Catholic or, or uh, agnostic, that, that kind of helps direct the conversation as to what parts of, that we need to start with. If someone's Catholic, well, then they already maybe accept God's Word. They already at least ha have some faith in, in Scripture. That, that, that changes the conversation. Then if you're talking to someone who's an atheist, who who complete, thinks it's all garbage. I mean, that, that's helpful to know what people believe. And so we asked questions. And then as Phil said, we, we sought to admire, ask, admire, admit. We sought to admire everything we could, we could, about what they believe. And that's not everything. Uh, so we had one girl who talked to a Satanist. Um, you might think, well, what in the world? How can we admire anything about that? And so we, all right, well, appreciate your, your you believe in the supernatural. So do I. Um, I, too, believe in Satan. Uh, you know, that's, there's, there's a, you can, you can admire, you can agree with something. You can find the common ground. You're not, you're not endorsing their belief system by doing that. We make it very clear that that's not what we're doing, but we're finding some point of agreement to build a conversation. Uh, I talked to a Muslim while I was uh, there, and, and we, agree, we disagree on quite a bit uh, as we got through the conversation, and he knew his stuff really well. And we were able to come. I, I appreciated his commitment to prayer. His commitment to prayer. I talked to a Catholic man who talked about needing to go to confession and how often and how significant that was. And I appreciated his, he, he, he believed that sin was serious. And that was a, I agree, sin is very serious. We need to confess our sin. I had a different, obviously we have a different perspective on that. But we were able to come to a, a common ground on, the, on the, the significance of sin. And that led in itself to share the gospel. And so we, we try to admire uh, something. We see this with Paul in Acts 17, um, in verses 22 and 23. Paul says this. He says, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. We see you finding... Uh, he found that they were religious, that they were very religious. There was something that he could see, that, and he used it to, to transition to the truth. And so we, we ask, and, and we admire, and we try even to encourage them to find something. If, if they can't find anything about a belief system, as I'm sharing, that they can admire, well, you can appreciate, you can, you can tell somebody, well, I really appreciate you sharing that with me. I admire you taking the time to talk to me. Not very many people want to talk about religion these days, and I thank you. I thank you for taking the time to share with me about what you believe. And uh, again, that goes a long way. It breaks stereotypes. And many people's stereotype of Christians, that we're just trying to jam things down their throat, or we're, we don't actually care about it. We just want to get the message across and then leave, go to the next person. And so when we take the time to listen and actually admiring, actually says you were listening because you, you found something that uh, you maybe have in common, you, you build bridges instead of walls. 
And so we, we, we try to ask, we, we, we try to admire something if possible, uh, and then we admit. We admit the reason that we are Christians is that we are so messed up, we need someone to rescue us. We need Jesus. We admit that we're Christians because of our sin problem. We see this again. Paul kind of, in some ways, does this in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13 to 15. He says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And that's present tense. Paul's talking in the present tense there, not in past tense. He's saved, he's an apostle, missionary. He says, I am the worst. Do you see yourself as the worst of all sinners? Do you, do you see yourself? Can you, admit, can you admit to others that you need, not just need a Jesus, you need Jesus? You need Jesus. Well, that, that starts the conversation, right? And you can get into, and that, that even in that, that might not fully contain the gospel. And some might go, well, that's great. That's nice for you. And so we did want to not just tell students how to start a conversation. We wanted to, to teach them a, a memorable way to share the gospel. And not the only way. And I said last week, you know, it may not even be the best way. Uh, I, I'm, not, I don't really, I'm not really concerned with what the best way is. It's a way, and a way is better than no way. Uh, and giving them a way to clearly, and a memorable way to share the gospel is important in the whole story of Scripture. And so we taught them, or um, I should say they taught them, uh, this, this gospel acronym. And these six points, they, they tell the story of, of Genesis through Revelation. We saw, you heard G. G starts in the beginning, like the, the very beginning, the, with good news. God created us to be with him. So different, uh, several different um, presentation styles, and you know, it, our, there's different strategies to sharing the gospel. Some start with the bad news. Uh, and that's that, that we're sinners, and that's, that's true. And I love this, that it starts with the way God intended things. God created us to be with him. Genesis 2, 6, As the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Genesis 1, 26, that we're, we find out we're, we're created in the image of God, we're made in the image of God. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And we see even in the first couple chapters of the Bible that we were created to be in an intimate relationship with God. In Genesis 3, 8, it says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God, and he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That, that we were intended to have this hand-in-hand type of relationship with God. That that was the way things were designed. It's the way things are supposed to be. And so we start with the good news before we dive into the bad news, that God created us to be with him, but our sins, the O, our sins separate us from God. Sin is breaking God's commands, violating God's character, missing God's mark. Genesis 2, 16, 17 says, And the, the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. You know, you know this. Again, as Phil said, this isn't hard. Most of you know all of this. There was only one command, total freedom to enjoy everything, but there was one tree that was off limits, and Satan tempted Eve, and here's what happened. And Chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And Adam and Eve made a choice and became sinners on the spot. And then our sin, their sin, became our sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, it changed everything. We see that later, uh, in Romans 5.12, that sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And so in that moment, uh, their eyes were opened, their, their doom was sealed. Genesis 2.17 says, You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So their doom was sealed, and so was ours. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. So God created us to be with him. Our sins separate us from God, and sin cannot be removed by good deeds. And that's important because a lot of, there's a lot of people with a Christian background that track with us for the first, the G and the O, and then we get to the S, and uh, they're, they're still trying to earn their way to heaven. They're still hoping to be good enough. They, they, they like, some people like the idea of a God, and they'll, they'll, they'll nod their heads, and they'll admit that there's sin, but they're still trying to do it in their own strength. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. We can never be good enough. 
We also uh, see that sins cannot be removed by good deeds because the law is a mirror to show us our sin, not a ladder to get us to heaven. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of our sin. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds because even our good deeds come from selfish motives. Isaiah 64.6, all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And so, we see God created us to be with him. Our sins separate us from God. And, and then sin uh, cannot, uh, I'm sorry, our, I just got tongue-tied there. I promise we memorized it. Sin cannot be removed by good deeds. Sin cannot be removed by good deeds. And then finally we get to the, the, really the good news here. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Jesus died in our place for our sins. His resurrection demonstrated that he was who he claimed to be. Acts 1-3 says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He didn't just die, he rose again, and he was seen by over 500 witnesses. He's not a ghost, he was not a hallucination. As some people claim uh, you might find 500 people who hallucinate, but they're not going to hallucinate over the same thing. They're not going to see the same thing. It was not a hallucination. That doesn't happen. And so we get to E. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. We're saved by grace through faith, not by good works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I tell the students, I had some, the students memorize a certain, uh, certain verses before the trip, and my intention was, uh, was that if anything else that you have, that you memorize some scripture, some, some gospel-saturated verses, so that if you get tongue-tied and you forget everything else, that you, you have the Bible stored up in your mind, and that you can't explain it better than, than God explains it. And you can just share the verses that you know. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 uh, were, were two of those verses. And I would encourage you, if you are wanting to take a step in, in learning how to share the gospel and, and, and moving forward with that, I would encourage you to memorize Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. There's other verses I would recommend as well. But start there. That is a great gospel-saturated verse. We said everyone who trusts in Christ alone has eternal life because we are justified by God the Father through faith in Jesus alone. Justification is a legal term that means declared righteous. It means that we are declared righteous. Romans 3, again, familiar verses, I'm sure, for some of you. 3, 21 to 24. It says, But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And so when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, he exchanges our sin for his righteousness. And many of you uh, probably have, are familiar with 2 Corinthians 5, 21. If not, again, another verse I would encourage you to memorize as you seek to share the gospel. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange, as some have referred to it. And finally, we end with the letter L. Life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. Eternal life begins as soon as you believe in Jesus. John 6, 47 says, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. The key phrase there is everlasting life. And eternal life really is eternal. I mean, there's actually some theologians that don't believe that. But eternal life really is eternal. It, it goes on forever. John 10, 28 to 30. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. No one. You have to be stronger. If you're going to take something out of my hand, you have to be stronger than me. You have to be able to pull it out of my hand. If you're going to take something out of God's hand, you have to be stronger than God. And, and nobody or no thing is, is, is stronger than God. Not even you can snatch yourself out of God's hand if, if you are a true believer. And so this life, now, this life starts now and lasts forever. And eternal life is not just about quantity. It's about quality. It's not just about eternity. Uh, the, the length of time is about quality. Jesus tells us that he's come to give us life and life abundantly. We seek to share that. We, we use the gospel acronym to keep us on point as we roll through that. And, and that was just, again, one way to go about sharing the gospel. 
And so we learned Ask, Admire, Admit. We learned the GOSBL acronym. But we did kind of help students land the plane. Uh, we wanted to give them some instruction. Okay, so you've shared it, and they might just nod their head the whole time. Well, then what? <laughs> what happens after you've, you've shared this? Um, because starting, you know, the, the starting the conversation is tough, but ending the conversation can be difficult as well. Or knowing what to do once you've shared the message, especially if you've been really nervous and you just like blurted it out, and then they're just looking at you like, oh, thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so you need somewhere to go. And so we, we, we took them to Acts 17, verses 32 and 34, and there's three responses that Paul got, that Paul received when he was sharing the gospel. It says, when they heard, this is Acts 17, verses 32 and 34, 32 through 34, so when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. And so we see that some rejected the gospel. Some, some were, were interested in wanting to know more, and, and some followed Paul. Some became believers. And that's generally the three responses we get when we're out on the street or talking to friends or talking to family. People are rejected. People might want to know more. People become believers. And in each case, it's a blessing. Each case is a success because we've been obedient to share the gospel. Timothy, well, Paul tells Timothy, he reminds Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.12, that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so although that is one of the the possible outcomes, one of the most probably more common outcomes that we have when we're sharing the gospel, we are in good company. Paul told us to expect that, that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's going to happen, especially if we're out sharing the gospel. In fact, some of the only times these students have been persecuted has been this, that week where they were in Chicago sharing the gospel. There's perhaps no other time where we face that level of spiritual warfare. And we count it an honor to be mocked or marginalized for Jesus because Jesus told us to count it an honor. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are in good company. It's an honor to be persecuted. And even when that happens, we remind the students that, that, that to not respond uh, in kind, uh, to respond kindly, uh, to respond uh, in a way that diffuses the, uh, or, uh, yeah, diffuses the, perhaps their anger or whatever their, or their animosity, whatever they're feeling, whatever that, whatever's caused it to escalate, we would encourage them in Romans twelve fourteen to bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So we're reminded that that's one of the outcomes, though, is that we will be persecuted. One outcome, though, is people will have questions, and so uh, we want to hear you again on this subject, and that is fantastic. I'm reminded of Nicodemus. Uh, we see Nicodemus in chapter 3 going up to Jesus, and uh, he's got questions, and Jesus, are you not the teacher in Israel? You don't know these things? I don't get the sense that Nicodemus quite understood everything at that point, but in the end, we see, we see Nicodemus going with him burying Jesus, taking the body. I think, I think somewhere along the line, Nicodemus had questions, and I'm not sure if in John chapter 3, if he, if he put his faith in Christ, but at some point, I think Nicodemus became a follower of Jesus. I don't know if it happened in one conversation or not. But so sometimes we need to give people time, let them ask questions, and follow up and pray for them. And I, I always I say, I get our jail free card, is saying, I don't know, but can we keep talking? Uh, if you don't know a question, it doesn't end. You just, just, just say, I don't know that. Can we keep talking? You can find out the answer later, or if just don't, don't end it. Keep it going. Finally, some will be ready to trust in Jesus. And this is amazing. We prepare students for this because we expect that that's going to happen. Uh, we don't just say, well, everyone's going to persecute you, but we're going to be obedient. And just do it. We prepare students for this. And like uh, Jack had mentioned, or someone had mentioned, our team, uh, by God's grace, this, we've taken, this is the fourth year we've done this trip, and we've never had the, the joy of being able to lead someone to Christ during that week, but we went out and shared the gospel, and in this year, six people came to Christ, put their, professed to put their faith in Christ through the faithfulness of our, our, our students. And one of, the, one of our young ladies who couldn't be here tonight called a friend back home during the week and shared the gospel with her, and she put her faith in Christ. It wasn't just strangers. And we, we, we coach people, or our students, in this because we expect it to happen, that if you share the gospel, 
people will respond to God's word. The Holy Spirit will, will work and do what only he can do. And so we, we kind of give them basic ABCs. One, encourage them to accept Christ. Encourage a decision. Encourage them to respond. Encourage them to respond. And then after that, we encourage them to belong to a church. We gave them information for local churches when we were in Chicago because we don't want believers in Chicago to come to Calvary. Uh, that would not be good. That'd be a long commute every morning, every Sunday morning. Uh, we we want to, we tried to encourage, plug them into a local church. And, and lastly, we want to encourage them to commit to the Great Commission. Uh, before they realize that a lot of Christians are not committed to the Great Commission, we want to encourage them to get committed to it. And so a lot of times the first question I ask is, is who do you know that needs to hear this? Who in your life needs to hear the gospel? And usually there's a, a mother, father, sister, brother, friend that they're thinking, wow, my so-and-so is not a Christian. Or, you know, people come to mind, and I, that's the first question I ask. And, and they, they just go and share. They don't realize that, you, you know, you need training or something like that. They just go and do it. They're some of the most ambitious evangelists are new believers, and it's good to get them going because, uh, like I said, sometimes uh, they just assume they've heard the gospel from a Christian. They assume all Christians are doing it, and we want them to start doing it before they realize that that might not be true. And so we encourage them to share the gospel. Encourage them to go share the gospel. And so in the beginning, I encourage you to imagine that you were going to share the gospel in the next 24 hours. I want to encourage you, will you? Will you? Will you pray? Pray tonight that God would give you an opportunity? You just heard a, one way to start a conversation. Like I said, it might not be the way you choose to use, but now you have at least one possibility. You could ask, admire, admit, and go that route. You heard one way of presenting the gospel, the G-O-S-P-L. You, there's Romans Road. There's the wordless book. There's countless other ways, but perhaps you know more than one, and you haven't used one in a long time. I would encourage you, will you consider sharing the gospel in the next 24 hours. Some of you are in here have kids. I want to wrap things up here. I, um, and I want you to imagine for a second that you left for the store. Uh, and, you, and you said, while I'm gone, if you could just make your beds while we're gone. Just a simple request. Uh, you, some of you parents have probably been in a similar situation. Whatever, name your task. But may, may say it's make your beds. And, and so you go and you come back and you ask them the question, did you make your beds? Uh, and imagine one of your children says, well, well, no, Dad, but we talked about it quite a bit. I mean, that was, the, that was what we talked about, really, the whole time you were gone. Or imagine another one of your children said, no, we didn't make our beds, but we Googled the best ways to do it. We watched some YouTube videos, and there's some really neat strategies out there on how to make beds quick and fat and do it, make it look like a military style, you know. And they, they, they said that. And imagine maybe another one of your children says, well, Mom, I, I didn't make my bed, but I wrote a song about it. I wrote a song about obeying my parents, and, and uh, we were actually singing it as you walked in the door. Uh, <laughs> now, my guess is that probably wouldn't fly in your household. You probably wouldn't believe them, uh, for one thing, but, but that probably wouldn't fly. I probably wouldn't go over really well. You probably just would expect them to make their bed. That's what you wanted. Knowing the best ways to do it, making a song, you know, creating a song and singing it about obeying parents and making beds, pro you know, that's fun, but that's not really what you're looking for. At the end of the day, you just wanted them to do it. And I think about evangelism sometimes in the same way. My, my guess is that many of us know many ways to do it. Perhaps we've sat through classes. Maybe we, we were comfortable singing songs about it. We're even okay talking about it. But I think for a lot of us, I think we're at a point where we just need to do it. Just need to do it. I quoted Spurgeon last week, so I want to quote him one more time before I close. And actually, you're not free to go yet. Yeah, I'm going to keep you for a little longer. But another quote from Spurgeon I really love. He said this, I would sooner bring one sinner to Jesus Christ than unravel all the mysteries of the divine word. For salvation is the one thing we are to live for. Amen? Amen.